Welcome, everybody. Um, once again, my name is G Fletcher, and today I'm going to talk about how we've been able to use machine learning to uh, dynamically optimize um, you know, critical cloud uh, native application performance, especially for, for railway operation. So as part of my research, I'm working on how to reduce latency for application performance. And this seminar is really to demonstrate how we've been, I've been able to apply my research in, a, in, in an area, in a, in a railway industry, um, to actually prove the value of my work um, in industry. So I'm being supervised, supervised by, by David Wallen, um, most of you know him. Um, and this is in collaboration also with Network Rail as well. So just to give you an idea of, uh, of how I plan to uh, roll out the content for today. Um, initially, I'm going to start to talk about the problem, give you a good, um, a bit of background information around what I'm trying to solve. And then eventually I'm going to delve into the railway use case. Um, I'll talk about the solution to the problem and also delve into detail about the approach that I have taken to be able to solve the problem as well. I'll then spend some time to go through the, the results of uh, my approach and then um, show you how I've been able to benchmark, benchmark my results also with current um, industry um, and benchmark as well. Then I'll go ahead and talk about some, some next steps and future work. And then I'm going to leave a few minutes at the end for questions as well. So um, latency is a very big problem. Latency is a very big problem. Um, the main cause of latency uh, right now is physical distance. So distance between, um, between someone trying to access an application and someone, um, someone trying to access an application from one location and the server where the application belongs or the server from which the application is being run is in a distant location. So we take um, a, you know, a scenario where you have John Smith who is sat somewhere in London trying to stream a YouTube uh, video from London. What we, what we really want to do is we want John Smith to be able to connect to um, a Google data center, which is located somewhere in Texas. And we want to see how the data, you know, the data, how, how he pings the server and also how the server is able to transmit data back to, uh, to John. From the user point of view, there's a lot of encapsulation and abstraction in the background. So you don't actually see the complex nature of, of, of the network um, in, the back, in the background. I'm going to talk about how this actually works and then explain how latency fits into the big picture as well. So in order to achieve this, there are different approaches. One of, one of the approaches um, is to um, obviously to, to use satellite where you can send from your mobile device, you, you are able to um, send um, electromagnetic waves to a satellite. And then a satellite will then transmit the waves back to um, the, the receiver um, of, of, the, of the host server and the information is sent back and forth. That, even though the satellite is able to um, deliver a lot of um, bandwidth to carry the packet, the packet back and forth, the big issue over here is that because the satellite is, is very, very far um, from the user. So we are looking at a distance of, of about 22,000 miles you know, from Earth to where the satellite is. So then being able to take in the data, going to the server and sending it back to the user, it takes quite a long time. So there is very, very high latency when you are dealing with, with the satellite. So because of the high latency issue with the satellite, what typically happens um, at the moment is as John Smith is trying to stream the YouTube video, um, he sends a, a request to a Google data center somewhere in Texas, and the Google data center then sends the information back to John Smith. Let's see how this actually happens. So this goes through a series of um, network resources, a combination of different network resources for the data to get back to John. Um, so we are looking at one of the resources, you know, could be a switch in combination with a router. Um, the data goes through from the switch to the router, and then on the way to John. But also one thing I like to point out over here is, so between the different network resources, you have a connection type and both and all the connection types do have some kind of capacity. So for example, if you are talking about, uh, about copper cables or, or, or fiber optic cables, um, you know, they all have different, different capacities where, where fiber optic is able to give you a more range, more capacity for you to, for you to transmit um, data back and forth. I've also demonstrated the, the satellite as an example of, um, of a connection type um, through which you can send data back and forth. 
So as you mean, the, the data has now been sent through a switch, through a router, it then goes through um, a fiber optic um, cable, cable connection, um, usually under the sea. So if you can see from my screen over here, I'm sh I, I am I'm trying to show the map of the United States and you can see the connections, the fiber cable, the undersea fiber cable um, connections, which have been um, made you know, between the, these two continents. So for John Smith to actually just get, um, just to be able to watch uh, you know, a simple YouTube video, the data needs to go all the way under the sea through the fiber optic cables to be able to reach uh, John Smith. There's an interesting website um, called the Submarine um, Cable Map. And this website actually gives you a live view of all the um, undersea um, cable connections. So you can look and see how densely, um, you know, how, how much um, different locations are connected. So from the um, Oceania region, there's a, there's a huge connection between that, that region to the United States, for example. There is also, you can see a dense, uh, quite a dense connection between the United States and our part of Europe. As well, and you know, whilst you go through through this map, you, it gives you a very very good view of um, exactly you know which point or where, where or which locations are are very very strongly uh, correlated in terms of the fiber optic cable which have been um, um, been put in place between the two different locations. That being said, so um, so so that being said. It does happen that sometimes the fiber um, um, optic cables, you know, do get interrupted. When when that happened about um, a year ago and also some years uh, beforehand, that certainly made the headlines in the news. You know, we had, there, there was a point where um, the, the Google fiber optic cables, you know, people within Eastern Europe, Turkey and Iran could not access some of the Google servers because a fiber optic cable had actually been interrupted. Um, so. A lot of things can happen while the data is, is, is tra traveling from one location to the other. Um, when it finally gets to the UK, it will then go through a number of different routers and different switches to eventually get to John Smith. So this is just to demonstrate the very, very complex, and this is a very, very simplified version of what actually happened. Um, so you can imagine that it takes a very, very long um, time or, it, or for data to travel, you have to go through a lot of different network points for the data to be able to get from one location to the other. When we talk about latency, we are also talking about round trip um, latency. So not just hanging, when you, when you want to actually get data from, um, from a server, you have to ping the server, the server needs to send the data to you. So round trip, so latency is actually just talking about both pinging and also getting the information back, which can take a while. Um, I've also shown on the right hand side um, that eventually, so. Um, the router would then need to communicate within a radio access network with a base station, and then that base station now connects to John Smith, uh, to John's phone. So this is a very, very, it takes a long time for, for all of this to happen. So latency, round trip latency is a big issue. Um, for most applications, it's actually fine. For most applications, if let's say um, a user is trying to watch a YouTube video like John Smith and the user is getting about 100 or 150 milliseconds of latency, it is usually okay for those kinds of applications. Plus, if the YouTube video delays a little bit before uh, the, the, the video plays, it's not, it doesn't cause too much of an issue to users as compared to some other use cases. Um, one of those use cases is the railway use case, which has a very, very high requirement for very, very low latency. And that is you know, the foundation of the work that I, I'm about to demonstrate. Before I do that, I want to ask to just have a very, very quick look at um, some of the latency around the world right now. So what I'm going to do um, right now is I'm going to ping service in different locations just to demonstrate that distance is actually a huge factor or yeah, really does slow down latency. So I'm pinging a server somewhere in Dallas, Texas, and let's see how long it takes to send information to, the, to ping the server and also get the information back. So that took about 117 uh, milliseconds. Let's ping a server somewhere in Singapore, which is further apart, and let's see what happens. So we can see that pinging our server and getting some kind of feedback back from the server right now, it takes about yeah, 260 milliseconds. So that is, that is fairly large. So, as you are observing right now, that the more distant the location is, the more time it takes for the for you to be able to get data back from the from the server. Let's try Bangalore. 
as well. About, about 140 milliseconds. And then let's try somewhere very close to home. Let's try London just to show how long it takes to ping a server in London, I guess, some kind of feedback. So, so for the most part, you can see that because London is very close, so me pinging a server from Oxford to, to London, it takes about 40 milliseconds uh, to get data back from London as compared to when we pinged a server somewhere in Dallas, Texas, which took way over 100 um, milliseconds to be able to get some data back. So this is all just to demonstrate that latency is um, an issue. So the more distant a server is from the requester, um, the more or the number of points through which the data needs to travel also increases as well. So someone, someone may ask, why do we care about this currently if most applications can actually survive with the current you know, latency challenges that we have? Over, over the past um, couple of years, so right from 1979, where we started seeing um, we, you know, um, the defense, the evolution of, of different communi wireless communication network. Um, till now, there's been about 40 years where um, different generations have, you know, have come to pass. So in 2019, some part of the world were already starting to roll out um, 5G. Now, in the past, some of the things we could not do, whilst throughout the evolution of the, of the wireless communication networks, we then see new opportunities to do new things. So in the past, for example, we couldn't, um, you know, there were very little opportunities to work on self-driving cars. Self-driving cars, because a self-driving car has a very, very, very um, high, has a strong requirement for very low latency and also high bandwidth because it needs a lot of, um, it needs to be, able to be able to send data back and forth very quickly. And also really needs that, that latency uh, to be as low as possible for, for it to be effective. So if the car was driving and if the car needed to make a decision, um, the car should be able to ping a server and get feedback from the server very quickly to be able to make that decision. Otherwise, if you know if it takes a long time, it takes about 100 milliseconds for the server to get some kind of feedback uh, from the server, then you know the, the car essentially is going to make a lot of mistakes, have a lot of accidents, which is which is not exactly what we would like to see. So if you look at some of the opportunities that 5G is bringing, um, it has allowed the mobile community to now think about a lot of new new use cases which they could not have have worked on in the past. 5G brings higher bandwidth. It works. It, it, it does. It does because the bandwidth is higher. Um, it does create opportunity for for low latency. But 5G alone is not enough. Um, it brings so seamless uh, mobility transfer. So the way uh, people connect and disconnect from different base stations is more seamless with 5G. Um, there's high connectivity, so now with 5G, you can have a lot of different devices to be connected to one network. So this is an opportunity for, you know, for people to explore the Internet of Things, where you can have a lot of these uh, devices connected to, to one particular network without any problem. There is a high energy uh, efficiency, energy savings also with 5G, so, and there are, and there are many more. So if you can see the, um, some, the new opportunities or the new advantages that 5G is bringing, it's making people be ambitious, think about use cases that they can now um, you know, work on to solve uh, business problems, to solve um, the everyday problems that people are having. Some of these use cases include, um, so for example, smart city is one of the use cases. Um, I mentioned self-driving car. Um, I spoke, so they are mission critical applications. So there are some applications which, which 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 are very it needs to it needs to work in a in a particular way in terms of the process. So let's say in a manufacturing environment where some robots some robots are performing a task, one one robot needs to finish the task before the other one also starts. So if there is latency or if there is delay and the previous robot does not finish their, their task, it makes it difficult for the other robot to also continue. Um, 3D video, uh, UHD screens. So, so these are all the different use cases which can now be explored because of the advantages that 5G is bringing. The, the future railways is also part of these use cases. And that is why I am doing this collaboration right now with Network Rail to look at what kind of opportunities are they looking at for future railways 
and what are their challenges? One of their challenges with 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 five G and and the new opportunities that they are looking at is latency. So I'm using my work to be able to enhance, um, to be able to enhance and to be able to provide the opportunity for uh, for network rails um, or any any railway industry uh, to be able to to use future applications at very low latencies. So on the screen right now, you can also see um, um, currently. Then the legacy networks that we have at the moment. So most of the applications that we use at the moment are around this region. So device, you know, remote controlling, and uh, personal cloud. People have clouds, uh, their own personal clouds, and 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 just most of the of, of the. I spoke about a YouTube video, if I stream a YouTube video. Most of them do exist within this region. So because they exist within this region, you can see that for latency around 100 milliseconds, it's actually not too bad for these kinds of applications. These applications can actually be delivered with, with, you know, with over 100 milliseconds um, latency. Whereas if you look into the, into the much gray area, the gray area, those types of applications, so those new types of 5G use cases, which I've just spoke about, those ones have a very, very um, strong requirement for low latency. So you can see most of them require latency between um, 10 milliseconds and, and below. And, and when, when we did that very short exercise, at the moment, it looks like if we're running one of these applications, the only server that would be able to meet th this need is the server that is based somewhere in London, which is not very realistic because you know, we want to be um, as, as dynamic, as flexible as possible. Um, if you had more people pinging the server, then, then 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 there would be an issue. So so how can we build a facility right now that can enhance or that can allow applications to be able to to perform at a very very low latency? Um, yeah, the final thought over here is because of the new types of applications um, which which are coming um, within the environment, it's very very important to be able to enhance the current traditional. Uh, radio access network. So then, so the current wireless wireless architecture that we have at the moment, it needs an enhancement to allow us to be able to achieve um, these requirements for new applications and and also and also IOTs as well. So let, let me talk about some of the approach uh, that I'm considering at the moment. Um, coming back to the railway use case. So um, with a railway use case, um, what we would really like to be able to do is. We spoke about a distant server being somewhere. So assuming this server, assuming the railway uh, use case here is based in the UK, somewhere in, in Oxford, for example, and the, the railway, talking about um, smart trains or, or, or the train has applications which are very high requirement for low latency. Um, in that case, for those applications to be able to perform very well, we don't really want the train to keep on communicating with that distant server because it takes a long time. You will not be able to achieve the, the, the latency requirement with that. What we really want to be able to do is we want to be able to run those applications as close as possible to the train. The way we are trying to do that, so we, the way we are trying to do that is initially we, we allow the train through the closest base station um, to be able to ping the distant server, the server, the server then sends the application back to the vicinity of the train. So what, 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 what we do over here is we use containers. So we use Kubernetes um, containers to be able to wrap, wrap around the application that the railway, um, want, the railway uh, you know, wants to use, pick up the application from the distant server and physically deposit the application on a server which is close to the railway. Most of the base stations that you see um, on the map do have some do have some some compute capacity, um, so because they have compute capacity, we are we are depending on on these base stations to be able to now serve as the server to be able to run those applications. So that is the strategy. The strategy that, that we are taking right now is, is is instead of running the application very far, let's run the application close to the user. Because if as we have dem demonstrated a few minutes ago, if you run the application very close to the user, then you can achieve the latency levels. And then what's going to happen is, whilst the, the, the other challenge we have with this is, because we are running the application very close to the user, in our current context or railway uh, use case, 
if the train is constantly moving, going from one location to the other. So whilst the train is constantly moving, how do you then um, build a facility that can dynamic, dynamically now uh, continue to move the application with the train? So when I started, I said, you, you, the application which is being um, sought for is wrapped around a container. It is deposited on a server, a base station server, which is close to the to the train, and then while the train is moving, the facility, which which the, um, the facility which what we have built is called Macron. So the the facility we have built will then dynamically now move the application from this server to that server because the train is now moving. You know, it's now in in much um, closer proximity to this to this particular server. The way we've been able to achieve um, this is by building um, two different routines. So we build a task scheduling routine um, and, a, and a data packet routing routine. So the task scheduling routine um, would allocate or would find out which server, which server or which base station is closest to the train to be able to achieve the kind of you know, the kind of latency requirement for the application. So, so assuming you are running an application, an application you know, requires a latency of let's say uh, 50 milliseconds, what the task scheduler over here would do is it would prioritize those applications that need um, you know below 10 below 10 milliseconds to run close to the base station. But then um, 50 milliseconds will then look for servers which are maybe a bit far from the train. But still would be able will still be able to deliver that 50 milliseconds um, latency for that particular train. So scheduling where to run the application is very important, and that is what the task scheduling module does. Um, when you look the packet and routing um, um, routine, also plays a very very important role, because as you saw initially, um, there are a lot of different network um, you know points through which data needs to travel to get to a person. So even though we may have, you know, we can use um, um, Macron to be able to, to tell the best place to run the application, but then to be able to actually run the application over there, data now needs to go back and forth. So we built the data packet routine to now be able to route the data in the most efficient way so that it's, it works hand in hand with the task scheduling routine to be able to deliver the kind of service that we have. So, so these two routines work together hand in hand to be able to dynamically allow a train or allow an application to move with a train. And the application would perform as though it has um, access to unlimited uh, resources and uh, through the very um, efficient and optimized way that it's being scheduled. So underlying these routines, some of the technologies that I've used for this is we've used machine learning, we've used, I spoke about um, containers, so um, Kubernetes containers wrapping, wrapping the applications and, 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 and picking the application and, and depositing the application on another um, server. Also, um, I've used edge, so edge computing. So edge computing paradigm is the foundation of the work that we are doing. Um, Edge is very similar to cloud computing. With cloud computing, you have to communicate with a server that's very far away. Um, but what we are trying to do is, you know, is formed on the basis of Edge, where you don't want to run the application very far away anymore. You want to run the application close to the user. So that's the whole idea behind Edge. We are also using C Run. So C Run, you can see that we work a lot with the radio access network over here. We work a lot with base stations. So we are using um, an, an enhanced radio access um, network architecture called CRUN, which, which works, um, which has some kind of benefits. So in terms of energy savings and also in terms of the efficiency um, by which the network also operates. So we are using that as well. Uh, I also use the distributor, uh, the distributed ledger technology, which is, uh, which is exactly the same technology that blockchain um, does use. And the way this technology is used in the system is anytime the scheduler um, allocates an application to a different server, it locks that transaction using the distributed ledger technology. So by doing that, it means at every point in time, all the servers within the network know which application is running, is run, is running where. It just allows it to be more dynamic and also more efficient in its, in its work. So let's deep dive a little bit into the railway scenario. Um, so what we are trying to achieve is to move from point A to point B, but then deliver on the um, but deliver on the applications um, requirements, performance requirements for uh, for the railway. We are considering 
the sectors uh, within real way that we are considering is we are looking at mainline, uh, regional, suburban, um, urban, metro, and also freight as well. The reason why we categorized um, our the railways and you know within these sectors is because these sectors differ in their rolling stock. So the kind of um, the, the kind of um, railway vehicle that actually works within these sectors are. You know, we, we have grouped them by by, by the different railway uh, rolling stock in which um, they use. So things like locomotives and uh, railway cars. We have also um, grouped them uh, in this sector because of the speed at which the rolling stock also operate, also because of the track geometry and also because of the surrounding environments. So, for example, if you if you went to London and the metro that the metro. Um, have a, yeah, so the metro that works in London, the kind of environment that's around the metro is very different from if you had, um, you know, a main line, if you had a train that was traveling, tra traveling from London to Oxford, for example. So we consider that and we group the trains within these sectors. So, so, so now what kinds of applications are we looking at within the railway industry? We are looking at all sorts of applications. Um, most of our applications, and I'll show you the applications in a minute. Most of them are, are around are around critical voice, um, critical data, and also critical video as well. Um, those applications we consider them to be critical for railway operation. So you can see that we have we have categorized those applications to be um, critical. We also have applications such as environmental sensors and telemetry. So those ones we have categorized those ones to be um, the applications which enhance the performance of the train. And then we have business applications which include um, all sorts of applications um, that don't directly impact the performance of the train. So a user who is sat on a train trying to play an online um, you know, multiplayer game on a train, that would be an example of a business application. So the railway um, owner wants to be able to allow um, customers who come on the train to be able to, you know, let's say if someone was traveling from London to Scotland, uh, to Edinburgh, the, the railway operator wants their customers to have, to be able to enjoy the journey and not have a lot of disruptions, in, you know, within the network. At the moment, if it travels, um, if we travel at the moment for, 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 for most of the, of the railway lines, you realize that sometimes the internet connection is a problem. And, and, and this is exactly the problem that we are trying to solve here. Some of the parameters, um, the, some of the parameters um, within that we consider of these applications include, so the class of the, of the application, so whether it's a critical, it's a performance enhancing, it's a business application. We look at what is the latency requirement for the application. So when I started, I said that initially the, the train will ping the distance server and then decide to bring the, you know, the wrapped um, or, or the containerized um, application close to the train. So the Macron, which we have developed, and it initially needs to know what is the, the the latency requirement for that application. Because then, if it knows the latency requirement, then when it pings the the server initially, it now knows that the latency for pinging the server is is 100 milliseconds. So so it it then needs to now bring the application close to the train because the 100 milliseconds just doesn't work for it. Whereas if if it knew the latency requirement and and after pinging the server, if it realized that the 100 milliseconds you know, works well for that kind of application, it doesn't do any kind of scheduling because actually for that distance, the latency requirement for that um, application works quite well. We look at the data rates, so the bandwidth, and uh, so the bandwidth talking about the, the capacity um, by which um, data packets also travel. So if you are using uh, fiber optic, then you have a bigger capacity. You can send more, you can send um, a high, a, a, a more dense um, packet of data than if you're using, let's say, DSL or, or if you're using um, a, a, a copper, um, a, 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 a copper ch channel to be able to, tra to transfer your packets as well. We look at the setup time of the application that the users are, um, of the devices that the users are using, and we look at the operational speed also, as well. So um, I'm not sure if you can see on the screen, but I've listed the the full range of applications which I considered for this use case. The the ones marked critical are, are the ones you know with 
with this background and then the performance enhancing have the green background and the business application are these ones. Now you can see that from this table, the latency requirement for these applications is actually the one, the applications that need very, very low latency is actually just these ones, you know, so these deeply um, marked green ones are the only ones which need um, low latency for, um, for the use cases which I'm considering. So we are looking at real robots the real robots um, need very, very low latency between zero and 10. And also drones um, for network rail to be able to use drones to, um, to operate within, uh, within their, their remit. They need the drones, the drones require um, to operate between zero and 10 milliseconds. But all the other ones, the maximum latency that they can work with is also around 100, some, some around 500, but most of them uh, have a maximum of 100. So we are going to try and achieve this latency requirements um, for these applications using Mequan, which we have developed. So now I'm going to go into detail about, check the time. I'm going to go into detail about um, how we've done the task scheduling and how we've done the data packet routes as well. So, so as I mentioned, um, there are some parameters of the applications which we consider. Um, we are using deep learning to be able to do the task scheduling. And so with deep learning, we need to, first of all, understand what are the inputs of the neural network which we are about to create. So the inputs that I considered for this use case, uh, first of all, I, I, I looked at input for the application. So latency requirement bandwidth, you know, what is the class or the priority of the application? I look at the user device. So the user, the person who is actually requesting for the application, it can be a person who is holding an iPad or a phone requesting for the application. It can also be the actual, you know, train. If the train is a, is a smart train, then the train itself is the device which is trying to, um, you know, con um, connect or, or, or speak with a distant um, server. And also I look at the railway information. So the railway information being, you know, um, being as, assuming, Assuming the user is not the train, then the actual train which is traveling, you consider things like in the direction in which the, in which the train is traveling, um, you look at the speed by which the train is traveling, the traffic density of the train, the time it's traveling, also you look at the location um, where it's traveling. All these are very important because different things happen at different locations. So the weather condition can be a factor um, because we are using the 5G, um, sometimes even just, you know, you. It's possible if the location is very dense, then you consider the possibility of interruptions because you are using wireless, uh, you are sending electromagnetic waves, you know, from an antenna. So if there are a lot of disruptions within that location, then what is the best way to now route uh, the data? We also look at, because we are working with, with a radio access network, we look at some of the resources within the radio access network, mainly resources around what are the actual base stations we are working with, what are the capacity of the base stations? How far are the base stations from the train? What is the weather temperature? What is the wind speed? What is the, um, um, the, the, the user equipment density? So user equipment density uh, talks about, you know, how many people are currently connected to that base station. And, and these are all, all very, very relevant um, input for the deep learning model, um, which, which we, we have built. So we have a, a, a multi-layer uh, perceptron, which is uh, fully, um, fully connected or, or deeply connected, as some people may put it. You can see that it accepts so input, um, through the, through, uh, it accepts uh, input through the input layer. So the inputs in that it accepts are these input I've just described. And then it goes through a series of hidden layers. For our current um, model, we do have three different hidden layers within the module. And then eventually there will be an it output. It outputs. It has two main outputs: where to run the application, so base station to run the application, but also it gives a second choice of a base station to to also run the application. This is because sometimes whilst it's moving one application from one server to the other, things can happen along the way. And so if the, the, the first base station is, is no more available because someone was playing a game and now the person, you know, there are more users on that particular game. So now their the base station has run out of resources, then, then the application now needs to be moved to the second choice base station. So it does give a prediction of a first choice um, a base station and also a second choice um, base station. Um, and 
So, so most of the work over here has actually been um, improving the accuracy of the prediction. The way that I have improved the accuracy of the prediction is first of all, um, in order to train the model. So we put in, um, you know, we we put in a set of inputs within a model, uh, within the model, and at every layer. So what happens is that when the inputs, um, when a layer is accepting an input, it accepts an input and also some weights. So every input is allocated a particular weight, which then tells you know how important that input is for predicting the right output. So you can see over here that whilst the input is, is, is going through the different layers, so you have this layer, the, the input um, is, is allocated some weight, it goes through that layer, it's allocated some weight, and then the model will, will make predictions of where to run the actual application. Um, it then compares the actual predictions to what actually happened, and then tries to come up, try to come up with a loss function. The loss function generates um, a loss call and and then you use an optimizer to to go back and to go back and readjust the weights. So the most important part of this whole thing we are trying to do is trying to have a very, very good judgment of how important the different input inputs are. If you can tell how important, if you can you can have a good um, you know op op optimized or, or a good understanding of how important the inputs are, it then helps you to to be able to always make the right um, predictions on which base station to run the applications on. So most of the work has actually been um, you know been been trialing um, different um, so different optimizers and also trying to improve um, just rerunning the optimi the optimizers um, in different iterations over the training data, and by doing that it allows uh, has allowed us to be able to improve the model over there. So a summary of our model is um, you know we use we use um, Keras. Um, Keras um, library to be able to do to build our deep learning model. Um, Keras because it, it wraps um, TensorFlow and also wraps uh, Theano, which are all very very powerful uh, frameworks for, um, for 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 deep learning. And all the work that we did was was fully uh, based in, in Python. Um, our model is 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 a fully connected mod, um, a fully connected model. So fully connected in the sense that. All the input maps on every so all the input maps on every single output. So you can see that it's fully connected to all the outputs. Um, we have we have one input layer. We have three hidden layers. We have one output layer. Um, we use so 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 every time for an input to move to a different um, um, hidden layer, you take all the inputs, um, assign width to the input, and then sum those inputs together. Before it before it goes through the different layers. So the way to do that is to use an activation function. The activation function that we, we've used for all our hidden layers is, is the is the ReLU activation function. And then we use the final layer. We used a sigmoid activation function because the sigmoid activation function the, within the, the final layer then then does give us the prediction of the different categories or or the different base stations, uh, uh, you know, by which by the different basis where we should actually run the applications. Um, we also took, took into account a, a loss function. We use the categorical uh, cross and entropy loss loss function because we are because we are, we are considering not um, this is not a binary classification problem. We actually you know it's a multi um, categorical uh, classification um, problem. So we we use the categorical um, cross entropy um, loss function for this. And the optimizer, which I spoke about um, spending a lot of time to use the optimizer to improve the way things work, the optimizer that we use as the adaptive um, moment, which is also called adapt as well. Now, after building the model, what we did was we spent, um, we trained the model for a very long time. So if I play this video, you can see that we've done a simulation of, uh, we've actually created a model train. And the way we train the model is to just allow the train to allow the train with the parameters or the train with the application which we have spoken about to just freely travel around the UK. So go from one city to the other and just keep on traveling from one location to the other for over 90 for over 96 hours. And by doing that for a very long time, we're then able to have enough um, training data to be able to, to to be able to work with our model. So I'll show you. So if you can see from our screen, you can see that you have a train that was traveling from London to uh, to Newcastle. 
and you can see the chain just traveling over there. In this, in this, in this um, example, where we trained uh, the, the model, we in this particular example, we're looking at a single track train. So we are looking at just just one train, uh, one train, one track, and and just a, a very a very little coach on a train traveling from London to, New, to Newcastle and covering a distance of over two hundred and forty seven uh, miles, uh, which took about two hours for for that travel to happen, and the number of base stations between London to Newcastle. To be able to to be able to achieve the result that we are looking at, is we are looking at about um, eighty base station along the way. Um, every base station we have given a base a base station. Every base station does have a coverage area, so our base station has about five kilometers um, coverage area to be able to to be able to 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 be able to um, deliver the kind of um, you know, to be able to send um, the electromagnetic magnetic waves to the users within that particular area. So our base station, we have defined that to have uh, five kilometers. And that, that, that's the, the industry standard for, for a standard um, base station coverage. Um, so after after training the model around um, the UK, after training the model around the UK, after allowing, after allowing the train to just keep on moving around the UK for 96 hours, what we did after that was to, to now do a test and see how effective our model is. So we did another another test again. So we looked at the model. Try um, we did a test from from London again to Newcastle, and then what we did after that is, after for the train to to travel from one location to the other, we build a set of base stations. So we are able to capture um, a set of base station between the different locations, and if you know the if you're able to build because we know the distance between london from point a to point b and we know the number of base stations within those locations then we can go ahead and do the scheduling that we like to do so that's the whole foundation of the work that we do i've shared a bit about the, the performance evaluation for the model um, that we work with so we looked at different um yeah, we looked at different um, performance metrics from from accuracy um, um error rate and also you can see over here that um, the, the recall recall for me was, was quite important because um, if you look at if you look at the, the confusion matrix actually then what we are trying to predict more recall is the most relevant metric for this uh, piece of work that we are doing we also look, looked at the, the f1 score but in general if you look at all the metrics and uh, performance metrics for this after the test, you can see that we do have a very strong performance metrics for a single track train that was traveling. When I'm demonstrating the result, I'll show you also some simulation we did for a double track train. So within the same track, you have one train going, one train coming. We also did a simulation for a quadruple track train. So within the same distance, you have you know four different tracks with trains going back and forth, which is quite interesting. So, so that is the task scheduling routine. Um, I'm now going to move on to the data packet uh, routing routine, which is also a very, very important piece. Um, of, of, yeah, a very, very, very important, important piece of the work that we are doing. If I, if I can go back to, to just this simulation, I want, wanted you guys to have a look at a demonstration of one of the simulations. So if I'm trying to, I'm trying to simulate the train moving from, from Oxford all the way to London, if I can zoom in a little bit, this is the model that we built. So you can actually see the train moving right from Oxford and going all the way to London. So this is exactly how 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 we build um, how we build the, our work. So because we know the two different points, um, you know, between which the train is traveling, we can then estimate how many base stations because every base station is about five kilometers, um, you know, big. We can now estimate how many base stations you know occupy that area and then know exactly how to be how to be able to to um, to schedule tasks in a way that, that makes sense or in a way that the applications are able to to achieve their latency requirements and their bandwidth requirements so this goes all the way down to uh, to london and then eventually it will give you a performance score on the applications you have on that particular railway so coming back to focus on the on 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 the data packet uh, routing DPR, so the data packet and routing routine uses reinforcement learning, and essentially it's a reinforcement learning and graph theory. So so we thought about 
if if we are able to schedule the tasks, then we want to also improve how data actually travels within the network. And the way that we thought about doing this is to actually to understand a bit more about the network, because if we can understand a bit more about the network, we can then use um, different you know computational methods to be able to enhance the network. Um, if you look over here, you can see the same uh, distance we had from London to Newcastle. What we did after that is we're able to use, you know, within a three-dimensional space, we're able to determine um, for every base station who are the neighbors of the base station. Because if you knew who the base station, who the neighbors of the base station is, you can essentially convert this layout into a graph. And if you can convert it into a graph, there are methods in graph theory which you can use to improve the way um, packets travel. So what we did was from here, you can now see that on the right hand side, we've been able to um, we be able to to label all the different base stations and also generate and also and also really build um, a network of who the neighbors of those base stations are. So now that we have this done, we converted we converted the actual map now into a graph. So now that we have a graph generated from this, it makes the problem a lot more easy now. It makes the problem um, a lot more easier to handle and. Within 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 uh, um, communication networks, there is already uh, there is already different strategies to be able to achieve how data travels within the network. What we did was we we implemented one of the strategies using our work, but also we introduced a uh, reinforcement learning um, as part of the implemented uh, of the already implemented strategy to see how much reinforcement learning is able to improve a currently a currently existing. Um, data routing strategy. So you can see that after we built the network, um, this is the reinforcement learning um, you know, architecture that we came up with. So essentially what we are trying to do over here is um, within the reinforcement learning um, environment, what we are trying to do is we are trying to allow reinforcement learning to be able to learn how packets are moving within the network. And every time there is a bottleneck, it learns how that bottleneck, that bottleneck happened. So it works. It, it seems to be working in a more reverse way. Instead of learning how to do things, it's rather learning how not to do things. So, and, and that's the advantage. So the existing strategies already know how to do things, but sometimes you have bottlenecks. So you have maybe within one particular network resource, like a router, there might be um, a lot of traffic over there. So because there's traffic over there, now data doesn't move as quick as it should. And because it's not moving as quick as it should, there is latency. So reinforcement learning keeps on learning from the network, from the network that we have created, learns how the data is moving around and based on what it knows about um, how, how the network resources perform, it can then learn from um, scenarios where there are bottlenecks. And then anytime it sees um, data routing the same way, it can predict if, it, if, if possibly there's going to be a bottleneck. And if there's going to be a bottleneck, it would, it would reroute the data to go through a different route. So that's the whole foundation of, of, of what we are doing with, with reinforcement learning. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip, um, I'm going to run very uh, quickly from here. So um, I'm, I'm going to start looking at some of the results that we have generated so far. Um, I'm going to start from the data, uh, from the DPR, from the data packet routine. So what, what you are seeing on the screen is I have implemented an open shortest path first algorithm which is one of the, uh, the known um, routing strategies for um, communication networks. So as you can see, you have um, the graph that I showed you earlier on, you have the graphs which are connected uh, you, within the network topology. So this, is, th this would be um, a, a, mesh, a mesh network. It's not fully mesh, it's a partial mesh uh, network, meaning not all the nodes are connected to every node, um, but they are connected partially. But what you can see is, Everywhere you are seeing the, the yellow flashes, those are it signifies data moving from, from, from one from one node to the other. What you can see is we have introduced on the on the right hand side, we have introduced uh, some Mecran's DPR routine. And where you see the greens, so the greens are the alternative um, routing you know, um, predictions or, or the, the alternative routing rec recommend, uh, recommendations made by the Mecran DPR routine, which you have built. 
Now, if you look at the difference, you can see that we did do some training um, over time and we did do some testing. Now, the result that you're seeing on the screen is at the bottom. You can see the, the x-axis is showing the, the number of hours it took to be able to, uh, to test the, the algorithm. And on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the y axis, you can see the average number of bottlenecks that actually happen. You can see that. So, this being the existing strategy, the current existing strategy for routing algorithms, you can see that our Mecron DPR has reduced the bottleneck by far over time. Over time, you can see that it continues to learn more about the network. It continues to understand how bottlenecks happen. It continues to understand how data is routing within the network, and it reduces the number of times that you have uh, a bottleneck, which is very, very imp impressive. So because it, it is reducing the number of bottlenecks which happen in the network, it means that our task scheduling routine would also work better because no network resources is holding data anywhere. I'm going to show you the, the results for the task scheduling routine. So we did a test for a single track. Um, on a single track train, we did a test from, you know, from Oxford to London. And then on the left um, charts, you can see at the bottom, the x-axis is showing you the time taken to travel, the, the time taken for the simulation, for the test um, simulation. And, and on the, on the y-axis um, is showing you the performance percentage. Performance percentage, the way we, we calculate performance is if an application says I need 10 milliseconds, how many, how much um, throughout the whole um, implementation period, how often was the application, you know, how much um, did Mecron deliver on the application's requirements? So, you, so, 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 so that's how that that that's how we compare. Um, that's how we compare to understand what the application wants and if the application indeed got what they want all the time to be able to test and see how how our algorithm is working. So, on the left hand side, you can see the worst case scenarios. The worst case scenario is you have the trains traveling. There is no scheduling happening at all. You can see with this one uh, that the the performance percentage for the applications are quite low. The applications, some of the applications perform at about 60, about about 68 percent, which is really not acceptable for if you are using a, a you know a critical um, um, mission application or a time a time critical application. You want you really want these applications to be able to perform very well. If if these are applications which are which are working in the factory or if these are um, a self driving car, you can you cannot really rely on this worst case scenario. Um, what we did was we we used uh, a, a well known um, scheduling algorithm within within computer networking called Packet uh, Fair Queuing, and Packet Fair Queuing was able to improve the worst case scenario by you know by this much. We then use our version, so Mecron, what we built to improve the worst case scenario. And you can see that with Mecron, we have a much, much higher performance with Mecron than you have with the benchmarked um, algorithm and also than the worst case. On the bottom, on the, on the bottom uh, of the screen, you can see how much Mecron has increased or has improved the performance of the worst case scenario. And also you can see how much Mecron has also improved the performance of the benchmarked scenario. So a similar situation with a double track where you have two tracks, two tracks um, with trains traveling um, in the same distance across London. In the worst case scenario, because there are two tracks now, there are a lot more applications over here. And because there are a lot more applications over here, you can see that in the worst case scenario, you have um, you have a bigger, a bigger um, problem in terms of performance. So some applications were performing at about 50, at about less than 50%, which is totally not, not acceptable. Um, the, yeah, the PFQ algorithm improved it by this much. Mecran improved it by a lot. Let's go to, to the quadruple uh, track scenario with a quadruple track. You can see that the performance was very, very diverse. It was sometimes it was worse than even the double track because you have a lot more uh, people on the train or a lot more applications fighting for resources. But then you can see that even with that um, amount of traffic, you can see that Mecron in the best case scenario has been able to improve the performance of the worst case very, very much as well. So um, that, yeah, so, so those are the results that we're able to achieve with this work, which we are very proud of. And the next step for us is we are using the work that I'm using for my default to work on a different use case, uh, to work on the, on the smart factory use case, and also to work uh, on a smart um, health infrastructure use, um, use case 
to be able to um, assist in, in, you know, in tropical medicine uh, research for, you know, for locations within the tropics. Um, and then the next steps for the work that I, I'm doing currently on this particular use case is to um, is to publish uh, three publications from the three different use cases. But also because we've developed a lot of code and, and, a, lot, and, and a number of libraries from the work we've done, we are looking to, uh, you know, to, to, to also just add to the whole philosophy of, 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 you know, of, of open software and make our code public so that people who are also starting to work either within the edge environment or on railway, they can have access to our code. And finally, we are also looking for, uh, yeah, we are also looking at uh, future opportunities to use the current work that I've done for my DFUEL to solve, you know, similar problems in different use cases. As you can see, the work that I've done can actually fit in a lot of use cases, as long as there is there are applications which have uh, a requirement for, for low licensing. So that's everything from me for now. Um, I would take questions from anybody. Um, if you have any questions, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Well, first, I'd like to thank Jude, everyone. If everyone unmutes and we thank Jude as we normally would. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great presentation. Great work. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, if, if anyone wants to um, have any further discussions, either on a, on a railway use case in particular, or want to look at my default work, I am more than happy to have conversation with people, um, you know, in a department or anyone online online right now. So just yeah, do reach out and 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 let me know. I'm happy to collaborate with with, with anybody at all. Thanks. If you have um, any particular questions, please uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask me. Otherwise, we have just two minutes on the clock to the end of this seminar. Obviously, it's a great effort you made here. So congratulations for that. Thank you very much, sir. Hi, Jude. A very nice presentation. I have one question. Sorry. Sure, yeah. Devki. Yeah. I'm listening. So, yeah. So my question is, uh, for, for training, how much time it will take uh, to just like uh, for performing the scheduling because i think uh, for time critical applications it is also necessary that uh, the scheduling will be performed uh, like very fast yeah so uh, yes In, indeed so what we do is that before we actually implement the system we do the training beforehand so if let's say there's a railway company within england who wants to work with our with our with our, with our, with our artifact or our work we will do the training with the company before it goes live. So by the time it goes live, it has been trained enough for that particular geographic locations, because you have to remember that every geographic location is different and the way base stations are placed in different geographic areas are also very different. So you do spend some time to do um, a lot of training and just by comparing the kind of results that you get um, after training, by testing it, you can you can then be able to tell whether you've been able to train your your model enough. But for our particular use case, so we did about you know nine six um, hours. That's a lot of hours of training. Um, I know Network Real um, did you have this dummy train within um, England? I think once every year they, they send the train um, to just it, it's a it's a yellow. I think it's painted yellow, and that train just goes around England to just collect um, information. So that could be, for example, it could be a very good opportunity for any um, railway uh, company to keep on training the, mo the, the model. And, and obviously because it's machine learning, even after it has, it has been trained, the more trains um, use the model, the better it also becomes as well. Thank you. No problem. Okay. So I would give people time back now. Um, thank you everybody for joining. And yeah, happy to talk about it later, but thank you very much for your time as well. It was Take an care. excellent talk to you. Thanks so much. <laughs> thank you very, very much, Marcel. Thank you, Jude. <laughs> no problem, David. Thank you very much as well. <laughs> you, Thanks, Jude, that was excellent. Fantastic.